So today is the start of a new teaching series, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at walking in the Holy Spirit day by day. What does it mean to be a Spirit-filled community? We're going to be looking at praying uh, by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then right at the end of this series, we're going to go back into the book of Acts where we left off, which is the very definition of a Spirit-filled community. So we really are focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the backdrop to all of this as well is that our lives have changed. Uh, over the last year or so, so many things have changed and are now different. My two-year-old was playing in our home recently and uh, she was playing with her brother and they were playing shops and they've got this imaginary shop with a little cash register and all sorts of foodstuffs that they buy and sell to each other. They're quite commercial about it, they do quite well. And, uh, and she ran up to me and she said, Daddy, Daddy, shop, shop, Daddy. And, uh, and I looked down and she was holding a face mask. And, uh, and so I said to her, I said, oh, do you need me to put your face mask on so you can go to the shop? And, uh, and she said, yes. And, uh, and so I put the face mask on her so that my two-year-old could go to an imaginary shop in my house. And it just made me think, gosh, the world has actually changed quite a little bit if that's in the imaginary play of our toddlers because they've never seen anything different. This morning, Martin is doing something which can only really be described as a miracle because he's actually preaching in Leeds and he's preaching in Whitchurch at the same time, which is pretty impressive. Uh, in Leeds, live through Zoom, and then in Whitchurch with a pre-recorded talk. So he's not even left his house in Shrewsbury, and he's preaching in two different places over the country. You wouldn't have thought that that would be occurring this time last year. Things have changed. Church life, it's been turned upside down. Everything that we enjoy, that we love, that we appreciate doing together has been restricted by the lockdowns and the other such things. I don't need to remind you, but it has changed. So the question we're asking is, what does it mean for us to live out our faith, to exercise our faith, to see the Holy Spirit at work day by day in this new world that we inhabit? And this is what we're going to be exploring. And it's Especially sort of um, in my mind almost, because at times I think when I've talked about the Holy Spirit like working in my life or experiencing God's power in my life, I'm often talking about a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling that I get during collective worship when I'm with my brothers and sisters together. Of course, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is so much more than that. But it can be quite difficult to describe, actually. If someone asks you, who is the Holy Spirit, how would we answer that? I think it's pretty clear with God the Father. We, we read about him, we hear about him, we, we know about God the Father. And then, and then Jesus, that's probably even clearer because we've got the record of his life and uh, we know what he was like here on earth and the other stuff that the Bible says about him. So it can feel quite clear about the Father and about the Son, but sometimes a little bit less clear about the Holy Spirit, about what he actually does. And the fact is that he does a huge amount. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is active right the way through the Bible. In fact, we've been reading Acts, and it's known as the Acts of the Apostles, but in many ways it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because he is the one who is doing so much of it and working through the people, the followers of Jesus. He's the one making everything happen. So in this series that we're now kicking off, what I'd love to do is to start with a bit of a foundation, really, on who the Holy Spirit is and on what he does. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking from like a clarity of all of what the Bible tells us about him. I mean, that's a bold claim. I'm not going to be able to say all of it today, but we have that rounded view of what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit rather than just our own experiences. Our own experiences are so important, but they are also limited. We're not going to start there. We're going to start with the scriptures. I love it when we worship together. I experience God's presence as we do that. 
We've done that this morning. I hear from God as I pray. Not all the time, but sometimes. I hear from God as I read the scriptures. But the Holy Spirit is so much more than what I see or hear in my own life. And I'm learning more and more that following his leading is actually seeing how he's at work, not just in me, but in the people around me and in the circumstances around me, in the situations around me, almost like being a sailor and uh, trying to work out where the wind is blowing and then changing plans in order to be able to sail. So as I said, we're going to be building our foundation from the Bible and then working back up. And week on week, we're going to be applying it in different ways. Let's start with a fairly obvious statement, but it's always good to start here. The Holy Spirit is God. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. And the Holy Spirit very much definitely is God. He has the attributes of God. He knows all things. 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 10, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except his own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So he knows all things and he is everywhere. Psalm 139 from verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. So he's everywhere and he's eternal. According to Hebrews 9, 14, who describes him, they describe him as the eternal spirit of God. So eternal, ever present, all knowing. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit acts as God acts because he is God. He was present at the time of creation. In the second verse of the whole of the Bible, it's the Spirit of God who is hovering over the waters. He's active in the miracles that we read about in the Bible. In Matthew 12, 28, Jesus says, it's by the Spirit that I drive out demons. Or in Romans 15, 19, Paul talks of powerful signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit. Back to Hebrews 9, verse 14, and it talks of Jesus through the eternal Spirit of God offered himself up without blemish. So our redemption in Christ and what he did on the cross was through the Spirit. And that makes sense because the Holy Spirit is also active as we come to faith. In John 3 verse 5, Jesus himself says, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. And Titus 3 spells it out even further because it says that he he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So he's there at the beginning in creation. He's there in the miracles. He's there in what Jesus did for us on the cross. He's there with us at the point that we are saved. God himself, his presence with us. And the Holy Spirit is also a sign, like a mark on us, that show we who uh, have made that step of choosing, of repenting and choosing to follow Jesus, we're marked by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 describes him as a seal on our hearts, like, like an old letter. And at the bottom of the letter where there would have been a seal that then would have had a stamp on it, which would have been like a signature. We display the signature of God through the Holy Spirit within us. And it also talks about him being like a guarantee or a deposit of God, of our future inheritance in Christ Jesus. So so God dwells within us now by his Holy Spirit, and that's like a deposit. That's like um, it, it's looking forward to a future where we will dwell with God in all of his glory. He dwells in us now by his Holy Spirit, a seal on our hearts, a deposit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit has very real purpose. He strengthens us according to Ephesians 3, 16, and he leads us, Ephesians 6, 17, so that we can bear the fruit that Galatians 5 tells us about. 
Romans 15, 13 says the spirit causes hope to overflow from us and that empowers our witness to the Lord Jesus. And Paul experiences, he experiences this in 1 Corinthians 2 where he says that his witness was not with wise or persuasive words but with the Holy Spirit's power. Strengthening, leading, fruitfulness, an overflow of hope that empowers us to live as witnesses to the Lord Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I look at that list. I need strengthening. I need leading and guiding. I, I need an overflow of hope in my life. I need help and empowering in order to live as a witness to the Lord Jesus, certainly not in my own strength. So the Holy Spirit always has a purpose. It's always about the glory of the Lord Jesus, about his kingdom, about his glory being made known on the earth. And I do just want to sort of sound a warning point here that there is there could be a danger within uh, charismatic churches like we are that sometimes it feels like the emphasis may have got the other way round, and it actually becomes about us and it becomes about how we feel. And, you know, perhaps we've heard things like I didn't get anything from the worship this morning. And uh, and actually that's that's. I question that a little bit because the worship isn't actually for us. It's for Jesus. It's that his name is lifted up. And, and in doing so, we will have experiences of God by his grace, by the work of the Holy Spirit. But that's not like why we do it. And I know I'm being a little bit cheeky there. And I know what people mean when they say that. But equally... We will benefit from our encounters with God. We do want to encounter God. Of course we do. But it really is about Jesus. What did Jesus think about our worship this morning? What does he feel about it? What did he receive from what we said about him today? There's uh, quite a funny satirical Christian website, which I occasionally read. And it has all sorts of spoof stories about the church. And uh, there was this one article that I'm going to read, uh, which really tickled me. Um, and it says, uh, the power of God waits in the church foyer until the chorus of the Holy Spirit song. According to attendees at this church, the power of God, as manifested in the third person of the Trinity, patiently waited in the foyer through several songs on Sunday morning before finally entering into the main sanctuary to flood the place as the gathered worshippers broke into the chorus of the hit worship song, Holy Spirit. After the service, the worship team reportedly apologised to the congregation for not having invited the Holy Spirit in sooner calling the first few songs a bit of a waste of time, as the spirit had not yet officially been informed that he was welcome to manifest his presence in a metaphysical way. That was my bad, the worship leader said. I made a judgment call to wait until song three to let God know that we really, really wanted him with us. They knew right away it was an error as people in the audience simply sang lyrics of the opening worship songs exalting Jesus without any obvious emotion. So uh, that's quite a hard read, to be honest. And, uh, and I think there's something there that uh, underneath the banter of it, there's something there that they're pointing out to do with our expectations and, and, and what we're really looking for in our worship. But please don't hear me wrong. I love to experience the Holy Spirit as we worship. That's, that's what we want. That's what we're aiming for because we're lifting up and glorifying the name of Jesus, and so his spirit is at work amongst us. Is, our worship, is the success of our worship grounded in how we feel about it, or what the Lord Jesus might feel about what we've brought to him? There has to be a balanced way forward, being totally open to the work of the Holy Spirit in a way that's completely biblical. And it always has the end result of lifting up the name of Jesus and bringing him the honor that he deserves. And as we do that, we will have incredible encounters with the power of God in many different ways. 
on Good Friday, uh, many of us gathered and, uh, and we read the scriptures and we, um, we broke bread together uh, in our homes. And, uh, and I just had that sense. It was such a moving time. There was a real sense of the power of God being at work as the scriptures were read publicly, as we shared communion together and broke bread. There wasn't the sort of like swinging off the chandeliers thing, but it was like God was with us as we, his people, gathered together and we brought glory and honor to the Lord Jesus on Good Friday. I'm going to carry on now talking about this foundation of who the Holy Spirit is. Rather than a strange and an unknowable force, the Holy Spirit has a personality. We can, we can know him. He speaks. We saw that recently in Acts 8 when he said to Philip, go near that chariot. And there's lots of different ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to people. I'm quite a visual learner. And as I'm praying, often I'll see a picture of something and, and then I'll pray into what I've just seen and that will really help me and to guide me as to what to pray. And I think one of the beauties of being a church family, of having the different parts that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, is hearing and seeing the different ways God speaks to different people and how they're given to different ones of us in different ways so it can build us up together as a body. We've seen that already this morning. I'm not going to go too much further down that because that is a talk for another week, being a Christian community. But God speaks to us individually and he speaks to us together through the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 26, Jesus promised the Spirit and said that he would teach them all things and help them to remember what he had said. This is so important. In the writing of the Bible, uh, 2 Timothy 3 tells us that it was God breathed. The spirit was at work in the writers of the Bible to create the record of what had happened. And now for us, reading the Bible, it's there. We've got it. We've got the words. We've got the text in front of us. We've got our minds. We've got our understanding. We've got our diligence with that. But also it's the Holy Spirit inside us that helps us to understand what it means and brings it alive to us and actually makes Jesus known through to us through what the scriptures say. Jesus also says in John 15 that the spirit of truth would testify about him. So when we're praying for people who, uh, who don't yet know Jesus, we're praying perhaps for opportunities that we would have to speak with them and to witness to them. But we're also praying that the Holy Spirit would speak to them directly, that he would testify to Jesus to them. As many of you know, we're currently running our Alpha course online. And uh, we had the wonderful news last Wednesday that the, the, the video last Wednesday had at the end of it a prayer of response and, uh, and two people came to the Alpha on Wednesday evening and said, as I was watching the video, I really felt prompted to pray that prayer that was at the end of the video. That is so fantastic. That's such a, a wonderful sign of the grace of God. And, and, but it's not about the Alpha course. Like we've got some great group leaders, that's brilliant. The videos are quite good, that's great. But it's the Holy Spirit working in people's hearts that would cause them to want to pray that prayer. The Holy Spirit speaks, he teaches, he bears witness to Christ and he also prays. In Romans 8, 26, it says, well, you know, when we don't have the words to say, it's the spirit himself who prays. And, uh, and many of us experience that if, um, if we pray in tongues. Uh, this morning, there was quite a lot going on in my household before, uh, before I left home. And I had a little 15 minute slot and, uh, and I had a decision there. Do I run through my talk again? And, uh, and polish it a little bit and, and hopefully have it a little bit more rehearsed? Or do I just take this time now to pray? So I, 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 I shut myself away in my room. I'm very grateful to Esther for releasing me to do that. And I shut myself in, in, away in my room for 15 minutes and just prayed in tongues. Because the most important thing this morning isn't that what I've said is a little bit more polished because I've done more practice. What matters this morning is that the Holy Spirit speaks through the scriptures to us as a community to build us up. 
we're going to be talking very much about praying in the spirit in uh, a, a few weeks time. We're going to give opportunity for different people to share their story as well as to what it means to them for the Holy Spirit to guide them as they pray. So he speaks, he teaches, he bears witness, he prays. The Holy Spirit also says no. And that's really quite important. Uh, in Acts 16, Paul and his companions, they're traveling and they wonder about going somewhere. But the Holy Spirit says no. And we do need to be careful that the Holy Spirit speaking to us isn't like a trump card that says yes to the things that we want to do. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says no, even if it seems or feels like a good idea. I've prayed about it and it feels right. Now, of course, that does have its place. I say that myself, but actually I walk past a chippy and I smell the chips and I feel hungry and that feels right too. But that isn't necessarily the Holy Spirit talking to me. So we just need to be careful when we hear God speak to us. We need to test what he's saying. We need to test it from scripture. We need to test it within the counsel of our Christian friends and the people close to us. We need to pray into it further. We need to allow others to pray into it further. The people that God has placed us alongside, none of us have the hotline to God. I'm certainly not claiming that I have it, that I have that at all. When I hear things from God or say that God's given me a picture or whatever, that needs to be tested by us as a body. And it's the witness of the Holy Spirit to all of us that will be the test. And the Holy Spirit has personal characteristics, not just some strange force like in Star Wars, but he's got a mind. Romans 8, 27, he has knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2, 11, he shows affection. Romans 15, 30, he has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. On the other side of that coin, he can be grieved. According to Ephesians 4.30, he can be blasphemed against according to Matthew 12.31 onwards. And he can be insulted according to Hebrews 10.29. And sadly, as we saw in Acts 7 verse 51, he can be resisted. So we're not just talking about a strange fuzzy feeling. We're talking about God himself, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who Jesus has sent to us. So how can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? In fact, what, why would we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit if he's already inside us? We've talked about the seal. We've talked about the deposit. If we already have him, how can we have more of him? And that's a really good question. And, and that's something that they found in the book of Acts. And we'll see this as we continue to go along where there were groups of believers who'd not yet received the spirit. So they'd received the spirit at the point of faith, but they were still prayed for. And then something new happened. And this new thing is known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a little bit like your gas boiler at home. Your boiler is just a metal box really. Forgive me if you're really into your gas boilers, but it is just a metal box. But when that pilot light goes on, suddenly that metal box is alive and ready and all the potential of what it was designed to do is ready. And then the gas flows properly and whoosh, the burner goes on and it is powered to do the very thing that it was made to do. If that pilot light goes out, there's nothing. It's stone cold. It has to have that flame inside all of the time and then it's ready. But then something else happens. The power to do what it was made to do. And that's one of the best analogies that I've heard to explain how we can have the Holy Spirit and also ask for more of the Holy Spirit. We have him inside us at the point of faith and we can ask for the power to do what God is calling us to do. So what is it that we actually need to do to receive the Holy Spirit? As we read Acts 1 and 2 at the start of our series in that book last year, we saw that Jesus promised the Spirit and then he asks them to wait and they spend that time praying, they spend that time worshipping and then the Holy Spirit comes. So they were in obedience to what he'd asked them to do. They were praying and they waited. 
The Holy Spirit isn't something we, we sort of whip up or generate within ourselves. In fact, he often moves in the quiet place when we're praying alone, when we're reading the Bible alone. And that's not a surprise really, because if I want to hear someone, if I want to hear what someone else is saying, generally I hear them better when all else is quiet. But he also speaks when we all come together and he speaks through the spiritual gifts within the church community during our collective worship. And that's a wonderful thing as well. We're gonna be looking at that specifically in a future week. It's interesting as well that when we come together and people share stuff, often what they share is what they've heard in the quiet place. And then they come to the gathering and they share it for the benefit of the whole body to build everybody up. And we've had that this morning with what Karen shared about the song that she was listening to on her own this morning in her home. But she brings it to us as a gathering and that's a blessing to the whole body, to the whole family. We need the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're devoting a few weeks to really focus on this. And we're going to be asking and seeking for more and more of God by the Holy Spirit. It starts in our prayer meeting tonight at seven o'clock. It'd be really great. There's one agenda, which is to ask God to move in power in our church. Week on week, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day life, in our Christian community, to help us as we pray. And I guess I'm going to finish with the invitation almost to come with us on this journey. And it's a journey that we're going to be making on our own as we pray, as we read the scriptures during the week. And it's a journey that we're going to be uh, experiencing together in our midweek groups as we gather on Sundays, looking, focusing on the Holy Spirit and inviting God to work. I was thinking about how to end this talk and, uh, and to draw the meeting to a close. And I thought, oh, you know, this would be a good moment to have a song and to invite the Holy Spirit to come. And then I was like, hang on a minute. That is great to do that. And I love to do that. But actually, I almost purposefully don't want to do that today because I, I don't want to like rely on the things around us as some sort of a mechanism to get to a point. Actually, we just want to invite God to come and to move. Recently, we had uh, an elders meeting on Zoom and, uh, and I was open with the other guys that, uh, that I was feeling a bit under pressure and, um, and, and a, bit, uh, a bit low and, uh, and I asked them to pray for me and they were really happy to do so. So we're all in our various houses and, uh, and, and it's over Zoom. And then it was Phil who prayed that the Holy Spirit would come and it would flood my life and would renew my spirit and would change me. And, and he did. And it, it's a strange thing because I'm sat on my bed with a laptop because that's the only quiet room in my house sometimes in this meeting. And I felt like, I felt like the Holy Spirit just sort of pour over me from my head and then down my body like water being poured over me. And, and it completely changed the way I felt. It really like renewed my spirit within me. I was sat there on my own in front of a screen, but it, the, the power of God was present with me on my own in my room. It didn't need me to have like a warm up. The laying on of hands was virtual, but the Holy Spirit was very much the same. And so week on week, we want to be praying for powerful encounters with God by the Holy Spirit in the quiet place and as we are together. And we'd love you to come with us on this journey. But I'm going to close by praying for us now. We're going to pray this evening. We're going to pray in midweek groups this week. Lord, send your spirit. We need you. Please work in power and have your way with us. So if you join with me now, I'm going to pray and I'm actually going to invite the Holy Spirit to, uh, I'm going to invite the Father to send the Holy Spirit to really work in us as a church and to work in us as individuals. So I'm going to pray now. Father, I want to thank you that you sent your son Jesus to make a way for you. And I want to thank you that Jesus promised to send the spirit to follow him so that those who came after would still know him. 
And Father, we want to ask that you would send your spirit and empower our church for that with which we're called. Lord, I want to pray for each individual here now, where we are, where we're sat. Lord, we want to be open. We need you to lead us. Lord, we need you to strengthen us. Lord, we want to see your, your, your fruit, your fruitfulness in our lives. Lord, we need that overflow of hope that comes by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you to empower us so that we can live as witnesses to the Lord Jesus. So we want to ask, would you send your spirit to us in the quiet place and to us as we gather? Lord, help us to remove the things that distract us. Help us in the week ahead to make time, even if it's the little blocks of time. Help us to make time to be with you. And Lord Jesus, our desire, both as individuals and together as a church, is that the name of the Lord Jesus is lifted up and glorified in this town and in the surrounding area. And we recognize, Holy Spirit, that we, we recognize that is the work of the Holy Spirit here on earth to testify to the Lord Jesus, to bring glory to the Lord Jesus. So we want to say humbly, we cannot do any of what you've called us to do without you and without your power. Lord, we humbly say, we're, we're completely reliant on you. Help us to know when to let go and when to step back to give you the space and you the room to move in power. Help us to recognize your voice when you're going ahead of us in, situ in situations and you're working. Help us, Lord, we pray. And I pray week on week, it would be like stepping stones of a new thing an understanding, a step forward, so that in three, four, five weeks time, when it comes to, we will have just seen this fullness of who the Holy Spirit is, of how, uh, Lord Jesus, you're working through your spirit in so many different ways. I pray for a real, like, vitality of learning and understanding and growing because we've experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives as individuals and as a church family together. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.